want to invite you to open a Bible to Psalm chapter 67. This week, we're going to begin a new sermon series where we are looking at the work of God, that what he has done for us in Christ Jesus, and then what that means for us as his followers, how we as his church bring that good news in all kinds of different ways, that good news of Jesus Christ into our community and into the world. And so the idea is that we would be witnesses, as Jesus tells us to be in Acts, that we would be witnesses to say to the world, this is who Jesus is, this is what he has done, and therefore, we are sharing that good news of God's love with you. We are serving you, we are meeting your needs, we are loving you, we are inviting you into a relationship with him so that more and more people would come to believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses, right? So he's summarizing in one little sentence the the whole purpose of us being a church is that we know and we believe as Christians that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? That's the Easter story. That's the whole point of our faith, that, that through Jesus, God is redeeming and saving humanity, And Peter says, and we're witnesses to that. So for you and me, that if we believe in Jesus, and we believe that God has raised him from the dead, then we get to join with Peter in saying, we're witnesses to the gospel. And the whole point of a witness is to share the story, to tell other people, this is what happened. This is who Jesus is. This is what God has done in Jesus for you. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is two things for you and I to hold on to as we go through this study of God's word over the coming weeks is one is that that you and I are loved by God. All right. That that's the basis of our whole life and faith and relationship with God is this belief that you and I, because of Jesus, are loved by God, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what we're going through, that he looks at you and me and he says, Yes, I love you. I forgive you. I redeem you. I'm making you whole again. And we're all great with that part, right? How many of you are like, you're just happy about that, that God loves you? And you're like, yeah, that's good. That's why I came to church. I wanted somebody to tell me that. But there's also a second part to what Peter says. There's a second part to the Christian life, which is we're also sent out into the world to be witnesses, Peter didn't just keep the disciples together and go, isn't it awesome how much God loves us? There was 120 of them that day. <laughs> what if Jesus, Peter was just like, isn't it so great that Jesus loves the 120 of us and never worried about everybody else? By the way, if they did that, you wouldn't be here rejoicing that God loves you. You realize that, right? (laughs) I know it it was a long time ago, but Peter realized by the power of the Holy Spirit, no, we're also sent. We're meant to be witnesses to the whole world. And that's what he says in Acts 2, when thousands of people from all over the world become baptized believers in Jesus. They have their sins forgiven. They become redeemed by Christ, and they come to faith and realize God loves us. And then what they do is they go back to their homes, scattered all across the world, across various places in the Roman Empire, and they become witnesses in their neighborhoods so that more and more people get to know God loves us. So with that in mind, that that we are loved and that we are sent, I want to look at Psalm chapter 67. So again, open up Bible to Psalm chapter 67, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Now, those words are probably familiar to you if you've ever made it to the end of a church service. Because at the end of the church service, guess what I say over you? Something very similar, right? This is a rewording of what we call the blessing or the benediction, which actually came in the book of Numbers from the high priest Aaron. And by the way, Aaron didn't invent it. You know who invented the blessing? God. He said, this is my promise to my people. He actually, if you read the whole chapter of Numbers, what God says afterwards is, this is how you're gonna know that you're my people, because I have put my blessing 
upon you. So we, we know these words, and how many of you like these words? Like how many of you would just, look, sometimes we criticize each other, right? Because we're human beings. Ever, anybody ever complain about something not being to your standards before in life? How many of you, <laughs> I'm gonna say it at the end, so I'm okay with this, okay? Be honest. I want to see a real honest show of hands participation right now. How many of you would be upset and actually say something either to me or to somebody else and ask them to say it to me? Because, you know, we're immature human beings as sinners, okay? If I got rid of the benediction and just like never said it ever again, and show of hands, come on. You could be honest in church. The Lord is judging you. Good. Yeah, see? Why? Because we like that promise, right? It's a beautiful promise. And it's not man-made. God himself created. God said, here's my promise to you as my people. Here's how you're going to know that you belong to me no matter how well you're doing in life, no matter how poorly you're doing in life, no matter how well you're loving me and faithfully following me, no matter if you're like the prodigal son and you've been running away your whole life. Here's how you're going to know that I'm always for you. Here's my promise. I'm blessing you. I'm giving you my grace and my favor and my peace, and I am shining my face on you. Now, depending on which hymnal, which translation of the Bible you grew up with, you might have heard the phrase, shine upon us, or countenance. Right? And we got rid of it because people struggled. We could not, we're like, no one's like, what does that mean? Okay, we stopped using the word. So we change it to make his face shine upon us. But here's what this really means. It literally means that God would smile upon you. Now think about that for a moment. Think about somebody that you really love. And when you look at them or you think about them or a memory of them comes into your heart or mind, what happens? You start to smile and you look goofy. And then people look at you and they're like, why are you smiling? I don't know. It's Love this person. They're like, okay. And, right? It, it doesn't mean, well, I'm smiling because they just did something, right? A lot of times it's just, what? I'm smiling because I love them. When I think about them, I have joy. I enjoy them and their presence and their relationship with me so much that what? I just, I can't help but smile. And that is what it means in the benediction. And that's what it means here in Psalm 67 when it says, for God to make his face shine upon you. It literally means that God is smiling over you. And that's a beautiful promise reminder. Because how many of you um, did not live perfectly this last week and that you would prefer God to not know it? Right? I mean, I know he does. We did confession, right? But you're like, and I would like my family and friends to not know this. I would really prefer if God wasn't aware. Because why? We're embarrassed. We feel guilty. Maybe we're ashamed of it. right? Or we're afraid. He'll stop loving. And this is why the benediction, why these words in Psalm 67 are so precious and important. Because they're a promise that when God looks at his people which includes you, includes you with all of your imperfections from the past week, he does what? He smiles over you. He doesn't roll his eyes and go, I, why again? Last week you confessed the exact same thing, and here we are again. Right? He doesn't get exasperated. He doesn't look at you and begin to grimace and go, oh, man, I'm filled with regret now. And he says, I'm going to be gracious to you. I want to make my face shine upon you. I'm going to smile over you. That's a beautiful, comforting promise from God's word about you. Because the devil wants us to get all into our own thoughts and emotions, right? To focus on ourselves. Uh, Martin Luther gave a wonderful definition of sin. He called it navel-gazing which means you're always inward focused, looking at yourself. And you're always looking at yourself and you're never looking at God. 
And that's where the devil wants to keep you, always looking at yourself. And sometimes that leads to pride. And you're like, I am so good. Everybody else said, come and see how awesome I am. And all of your friends are annoyed with you when you do that, by the way. But other times, we start focusing on my imperfections, right? Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have thought that. Why did I do that? I, I don't know why, what overcame me and why I did that at all. Sometimes there's addictions or struggles. Maybe there's anger and hate and bitterness just taking root and we just get absorbed into it. We just, like Luther said, we just keep looking in on ourselves and looking at ourselves. And before you know it, Satan has convinced you, you're not worth smiling over. You're not worth rejoicing over. Right? You're not valuable enough. You're not worth being loved. And we can go down this terrible road as human beings where you go, oh, Look how awful I have been. Look at all my shortcomings. And this is why God gives his people, even way back then in the day of Aaron and Moses, this wonderful promise says, here's how you're going to know my, you're my people. I've put my blessing on you. I've promised to give you my grace. I've promised to give you my peace. And I've promised to rejoice over you. I'm making my face shine upon you. I'm, I'm smiling over you. So even when you and I are stuck looking in on ourselves, absorbed into our sins and our mistakes and all of our shortcomings and going, nope, I guess that's all I'll ever be. Why can't I get over this? Why am I still struggling with it? Why am I still feeling this way? Even when you're doing that, here's how much God loves you. He says, I'm still going to smile over you. How many of you have ever loved somebody and they sinned against you? Show of hands. A few of you haven't. Wow, you got the best friends in the whole wide world. But all of us have, right? Every single human being that you've ever loved, that when you think of them, you smile, has sinned against you, right? They've done something to hurt you, disappoint you, let you down. Now, how many of you, you still love those people, and when you think of them, you still smile and rejoice, right? Even though they did what? They, they sinned. Now think about that for a moment. You're just you. <laughs> Like, you and I are nowhere near as gracious or generous with love and forgiveness as God is. So if you and I are capable as humans to go, okay, look, this person has hurt me, they've sinned against me, whatever form that has taken, but yet I love them so much that when I think about them, I still have joy, I rejoice with them, I smile. Imagine how much more God does that over you. Like here's the reality. Yeah, you, you're going to sin against God. You are not going to do everything perfectly. You are going to come up short. You are going to struggle with certain things in your life, and you're going to wonder week after week, haven't I gotten over this yet? Apparently not. And the good news of God's promise over you is you're still loved. He's still rejoicing over you. He's still smiling over you. It's not a formality that I do at the end of the service because someone put it in a hymnal. <laughs> it's meant to be a reminder to you of God's promise over your life, that he is giving you his favor, he's giving you his grace, he's giving you his peace, he is rejoicing and smiling over you. Even in your mess, even in your imperfections and shortcomings, he's still, no, you're the one I wanna rejoice over. And when we think, how can that possibly be true? What you need and I need to do is always remember the cross. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, while we were still weak and while we were still sinners, God showed his perfect love for us in this, that Jesus died for us. So it is while you are still struggling and not overcoming like you wish you had. Right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I bet a lot of us have certain things that we're like, I can't believe I did it again. 
I thought I was better than that. I thought I had improved. I even made a list of goals and strategies. And we come up feeling weak, right? Because, well, I did it again. And while we were still sinners, so while we're still absorbed with ourselves, while we're still rejecting God, while we're still running away from his ways, the whole promise of the gospel is that God shows his perfect love for you and that in all of your weakness, in all of your sin, all of your shortcomings, Jesus dies for you. He forgives you. He redeems you. So that every single time God looks at you, he smiles. He doesn't get annoyed. He doesn't get disappointed. He looks at you and goes, well, that's my child that I redeemed. That's my son that I've forgiven. That's my daughter that I love. And he looks at you and all of our shortcomings, all of our weaknesses and says, now I'm going to rejoice over you. I'm going to smile over you. And that's the good news of the gospel. That you and I are loved by God. That verse one where it says, may God be gracious to us and bless us, make his face to shine upon us, that he would smile over us, is absolutely true about you because of Jesus. But there's the rest of the psalm. That you and I, as Christians, are not called to spend our lives just going, getting together and going, isn't it great <laughs> that God loves us? Well, yeah, we want to do that. That's part of it, right? But we don't want to be like Peter going, oh, what if we just stay here? What if it was just like Peter and the apostles going, oh, it's just 120 of us and God loves us and Jesus rose from dead. Isn't that wonderful? Let's not tell anybody. But that's a temptation, right? To go, I mean, I, I got God. He loves me. I'm good for the rest of my life. I don't have to tell anybody, it's not, it's, not, it's, my, it's not my place, it's not my business. Except for the fact that the Bible over and over and over and over again tells us as followers of Jesus that's actually exactly what we're supposed to do. That we take that love of God that you and I are rejoicing in and taking comfort in no matter who we are and going out into the world and saying, there's other people that need to know that God is smiling over them. Think about that for a moment. There are people in your life, in your neighborhoods, that you work with, that you go to school with, that you work with, and they need to know the God of the Bible is actually for them and on their side. And he loves them no matter what they're going through no matter how they're living, that God looks at his children, his creation, that he is redeeming through Jesus on the cross and saying, I love you. I'm smiling over you. I'm not against you. And so this is what the Psalm says in verse two. We want God to love us. That's verse one. God loves us. He smiles over us. We love that one. We're like, woo, so excited. Verse two, so that... Your way may be known on the earth so that your saving power among all the nations. So what is the Bible saying? The whole purpose of God loving you, redeeming you, and smiling over you is. So that you could get together and say, awesome. Is that it? Yes or no? No, that's not it. What it I, I just read it for you. Right? It's not a trick question. It's verse 2. So that what? The whole world would know, right? That the whole world would know what? The ways of God. That the whole world would know what? His saving power. See, you and I are absolutely perfectly loved by God. Right here, right now. God loves you. He's rejoicing over you. He was smiling over you. And he's doing it with a purpose. And that purpose is so that you and I could join Peter in saying, and we're witnesses. Right? And we would be able to say, this is what God did in Jesus. 
He died to forgive our sins and to redeem us. He rose from the dead to give us eternal life so that we would always know that God loves us no matter what, that God is rejoicing over us, that God is smiling over us no matter what, so that we could go and tell the world. So there's a purpose to your redemption. There's a purpose to God's love in your life. And it's not for you and I to keep it a secret from as many people as possible. No, the purpose is actually the opposite. It's so that you and I could go into the world and and find people that are hurting and struggling and in need of grace and go, hey, did you know that God is actually for you? That God loves you in your hurting? That God is in love with you in your sin and in your struggles? That you and I would go out into the world and make that saving power of Jesus known among all nations, among all people, which includes, just so you know, everybody, which means you and I don't get to go around and say, not them, God. Now, no one ever says that out loud. But we do say it with our inaction and our silence. Not them, Lord. I don't want to reach out to them. I don't want to share with this person or that person or another way we usually do it. Boy, they're so bad. When they, when they get it together just a little bit more, then what? Then maybe they'll be worth sharing the gospel with. But what does the Bible say to do? Anybody? All nations which is everybody, right? Like, so who gets left off the list? Nobody. Now, I want you to think for a moment about how much joy and comfort it brings to you and your heart and your soul to know God loves me as I am. He is smiling over me despite all my shortcomings. It's wonderful, isn't it? Now I want you to think about the people that don't know it and how much more joy they would have in their life if someone, meaning you, (laughs) told them, God is for you. God loves you. He's smiling over you in Jesus. They would probably have just as much joy and comfort and hope that you and I have, right? And this is our job. This is our task to go, we are so loved by God that the rest of the world needs to know about it. You and I are not loved by God to sit on our butts and do nothing. That's as blunt as I'm trying to be. You and I are loved by God to be sent out into the world like Peter and the apostles, to be witnesses to what he has done in Jesus Christ. That he has loved the whole world while they were still weak and struggling. He has loved the whole world while they were still sinners and rebelling against him. And he did so by sending Jesus to die on a cross to forgive them and redeem them just like he did for you. And just like Peter, we're supposed to stand up in the whole world and go, and we're witnesses to that. We're witnesses to the love of God. You have, like, this is just one sermon. (laughs) I'm going to trap you because I love you. You no longer have any excuse because I told you that this is the benediction, right? So guess what? (laughs) No matter whatever else I ever preach on, every single Sunday, because I'm not getting rid of it because all of you raise your hand, and I don't want to deal with that, Okay. (laughs) Every single Sunday when I say the benediction, guess what? It's a reminder that you and I are loved and also sent by God, right? Can we agree on that? Every Sunday that we think that, we're, okay, here it is. Now, I just want to read the rest of it so that we can just have the joy of what it's like to share the gospel, okay? Verse three, let the peoples praise you. So who's that? It's everybody, right? How are they going to praise God? 
by knowing him. Thank you. Good job. So you are finally, we're participating together. Martin Luther said the sermon is supposed to be a dialogue. There you go. All right. They're going to know how to praise him because somebody shared the good news with them, right? And that somebody is who? Us. All right. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the people. So it's just in case you forgot, there's an extra emphasis, right? All y'all. I know I've shared that as a text. And Okay. Let all the peoples praise you. Meaning God's desire is what? That everybody would know his grace, his favor, his peace, his blessing, that he is smiling over them. And the way they're going to know it is that those of us who are loved by God leave as those who are sent by God to share that good news. Verse four, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. So how are the nations going to be glad and sing for joy? Somebody has to tell them what we're rejoicing over. Why are we, you guys singing songs? Why are you guys praying? Why are you guys telling the Lord thank you? Why do you have joy in the midst of hardship? They're going to want to know the answer to that. And it's our job to tell them the answer, which is Jesus, right? Oh, well, we, we are witnesses to what God has done for us in the whole world through Jesus Christ. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. So again, it's the same theme. God wants all the people in the world to praise him, to rejoice at his name. And they're only going to know to do that when those of us who have been so perfectly loved by God go out in the world as those who are sent by God to share the good news. The earth has yielded to increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him or worship him. And how do we do that? How do we know that God has blessed us, that God is smiling over us? Well, because in our weakness and in our sin, Christ died for us. And how is the whole world to the ends of the earth going to fear him and worship him? That those of us who know what God has done in Jesus, those of us who, like Peter, are witnesses to that work and to that love, go out as sent and called servants of the Lord, sharing the good news, inviting other people to know how much God loves them, that God is for them, not against them, that God actually loves them as they are in Christ Jesus, and that when God looks at them, he sees children that he has joy over and that he smiles over. All right, so we're going to say it a couple of times this morning, if that's okay with you. Here is the blessing, just so we get in the habit of reminding ourselves, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you. If you can write your own, right here, you say, the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have redeemed us, that you have shown us God's perfect love, that in our weakness and in our sin, you died to redeem us, forgive us, and make us whole. As we live in that blessing, that as the, you smile upon us, Lord, may we go out and share that good news so that the nation, so that all the peoples of the earth may be glad and rejoice that you love them. In your name we pray. Amen.